Please note, this session is being recorded. Okay, everyone. Good afternoon or good, good evening, wherever you are. So we have a great presenter today, Dr. Lisa Thompson. Dr. Thompson is an associate professor in the School of Nursing at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia, and she has conducted research for more than 20 years in Guatemala on projects related to air pollution. And she has several uh, funding from several uh, organizations and federal, uh, including NIH. And I will let her explain what she is doing in this project herself. But before going to start uh, the presentation, I would like to let everyone know that I'm the outgoing uh, co-chair and Lisa is incoming co-chair. She has accepted our invitation to be the co-chair that's going to happen uh, starting this May. And she is co-chairing with Luz Huntington Moscus, which I used to uh, co-chair with her for a year and I enjoyed working with her. And uh, so it's, it's been a journey. If anyone really wants to be involved in this position and help our research work group to grow and bring new ideas, then we will always welcome you. Please contact the new co-chairs if you are uh, really interested in becoming next uh, co-chair for this group. Don't hesitate to contact these co-chairs and they will help you in learning the process and how to handle that. It's not really a big work to do. It's kind of uh, is a volunteer work. So it takes your time for about one to two hours a week. It depends on what you are doing. But anyway, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone for helping me to run this work group, especially Luz. And also I had Jessica before. And also we had Barb uh, before Jessica. So, uh, Lisa, I think that I will give you the uh, podium so that you can start the presentation. And thank you so much for accepting the invitation. Sure. Can you see my screen? Yes. 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 I don't know if you can see my presentation. Yes, we do. Okay. All right. Um, so thank you very much, Azita and Luz, and um, I'm glad to be a part of this uh, working group. I'm going to talk about a pilot project that I've been working on for the past year and a half, and that is quantifying the air pollution burden from plastic waste um, and searching for community-based solutions in a rural indigenous community in Guatemala. So first, a little bit of background about how I got interested in the and thinking about plastic waste. Um, and I've spent the past 20 years working on projects related to household air pollution. And that's represented by the little fire um, on the far side of your screen. Um, that's a cooking fire, an open, what we call an open fire. And then uh, the little picture of outdoor ambient air pollution. So I think it's important to know that ambient and household air pollution combined represent the single largest environmental risk factor for uh, death and disability. Um, but the comp contribution from burning waste, specifically plastic waste, has not been evaluated. And in fact, these two sources of air pollution, um, indoor or household air pollution and outdoor air pollution, contribute to 5 million global premature deaths in 2017 primarily from cardiovascular and respiratory disease. And most of these deaths occur in low and middle income countries, um, probably because of low resources in terms of access to healthcare, lack of environmental policies, or if there are policies and inability to enforce laws, uh, mostly related to outdoor air pollution. So um, I wanted to talk about how the two relate. So here's a picture of a house in Guatemala with the chimney stove and you can see the smoke coming out of the house. And that's why it's important to, to know that household air pollution is a major contributor to ambient air pollution. 
And in fact, cooking smoke is the source of 12% of global ambient fine particulate matter. And um, that uh, is equivalent to causing 500,000 of the 4 million premature annual global deaths from ambient air pollution. Because what's in the house, if there's a chimney, goes outside the house. And um, this is um, something that we don't think about in terms of climate change. We think about outdoor air pollution, but this is a source for a large part of the developing world, cooking inside the home with solid fuels like wood, coal, charcoal, and animal um, dung. So specifically household air pollution in Guatemala is a significant problem because over 95% of rural households use solid fuels, um, typically wood for cooking. And because of that large burden, um, ha household air pollution or HAP is the fifth leading cause of death in Guatemala. Um, and we, we know from census data recently reported that 71% 71, 71 of rural households burn waste as a primary means of disposal. And um, while we, there's a lot of clean cook stove programs that have come out in Guatemala, Central America, and around the world that have focused on the health consequences of household air pollution inside the home, programs have not addressed waste burning and specifically the burning of plastic. This is a chimney stove. This is an example of a cook stove program, which I will describe because when I was a graduate student in 2002, I started to work on this, the RESPIRE trial in rural Guatemala, and that study was conducted through 2005. Um, and we conducted a study where we randomized 500 households to receive the chimney stove like the one on the right, and we followed the children for two years. Um, we found over this period of time, these uh, infants were recruited at three months and followed until they reached 24 months. So over that uh, 18 month period, we saw that this chimney stove reduced child exposure by 50%. So it, it did reduce their exposure. And consequently pneumonia that, that we studied was reduced by 22%. So that's clinically significant, but it was not statistically significant. And since that time, and other studies have also found that these types of chimney stoves are just not clean enough to improve health, partly because the smoke goes outside the home, but also because um, there's still quite a bit of smoke inside the home. So that leads to the next study that we're currently um, in our fourth year. And I, I did present this um, on another presentation at Sigma Theta Tau. And so I just have one slide here to just give you the background on this study. It's called the HAPEN trial. And it's also an 18 month randomized controlled field trial. And this time though, we're instead of 500 households, we're recruiting 3,200 households in four countries. Guatemala is one of the countries and also India, Peru, and Rwanda. And we're providing to half the households um, a liquefied petroleum gas stove, which is, um, kind of like the stoves we barbecue with, with the propane gas. So they have cylinders of gas. Um, and then we provide the free fuel to these homes for, for 18 months. At the end of the trial, just like the Respire trial, the control group gets the, the, the intervention stove. Um, and our primary outcomes for this study are low birth weight, infant stunting at 12 months, and the incidence of infant severe pneumonia, primarily because the the study with uh, several different studies with wood um, cook stoves have not found an, a, a statistically significant effect on infant severe pneumonia. So that's a picture of the stove that we give in Guatemala. It has three burners. It has a flat griddle for cooking tortillas, which is a staple food in Guatemala. And you can't see the tanks because um, we install the tanks outside the home for um, safety reasons. And um, we also give the family uh, clean enamel pots to use um, instead of the charred pots they used previously on their open fire. And we also give them a calendar that, um, that shows safety um, and other uh, benefits of using a, a stove um, that in studies we have seen cleans the air 
to the levels um, a reduction in pul- um, particulate matter that is substantially improved over a wood stove with a chimney. So now these are the two studies I've mostly been working in the kitchen for the past 20 years. My motivations for the study was over the years, I have found that people burn plastic. So you can see on the left, um, this is an outdoor open fire and they're actually getting ready to burn Crocs, shoes, plastic bottles, Um, And then inside that chimney stove in the middle are a green plastic bag and like a a blue plastic Tupperware. So, um, you know, we've done studies where we ask people um, about this and they say that sometimes the plastic helps to start the fire faster, but that they don't like the black stinky smoke. So they they know it's bad for them, but they have no um, kind of no choice or um, another way to do things. And What you can see on the far um, side of the screen is the rural dump with with all, you can mostly see a lot of plastic bags and things there and uh, fires going on at the rural dump as well to dispose of this mounting trash. So the study is a small pilot study and um, these are the aims. So the first one was we use qualitative methods to explore perceptions of solid waste specifically plastic waste in one rural Guatemalan community. And we worked to d- figure out what would be future actions that they could take to mitigate the burden. Um, and the second aim was to estimate the air pollutant emissions from plastic burning in 50 rural households. And the third aim was um, to measure differences in personal exposures to personal particulate matter, as well as urinary biomarkers of Um, compounds that are um, present when you burn things like polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, volatile organic compounds, phenols and phthalates. Um, So some could be from burning um, the wood and some could be from burning plastic like the phthalates. Um, And we did this in 60 adolescent girls in the Happen trial. So I'm gonna describe each of these three aims briefly. So AIM-1 was actually a lot of fun. Um, We have a Guatemalan anthropologist who's worked for us over the years, and she conducted an eight-week program in one community. And really, um, she she started off by talking about plastic accumulation and persistence, and this led to a discussion of the plastic that um, they dump in the rivers and then uh, that it flows to the ocean, harms sea, sea creatures, which they didn't know. Um, But from there, uh, she formed working groups to discuss alternatives to burning and dumping plastic in ravines. And the um, participants wanted to compost because they said that they were dumping plastic and organic matter into the same area and then burning all of it. And they wanted to think about composting organic materials. They wanted to um, make soaps from plant materials. um, Something that that was discussed was the the plasticizers and and shampoo bottles and things like that. Um, They wanted to to talk about organic farming. And we had people from recycling centers come up to the community and talk with them about their recycling programs, which included e-waste disposal. And um, and that was a substantial part of, of of the work that we did in that community. So these are just two of the educational sessions. The the one on the right is the community composting. And um, that was very participatory. Um, The women brought um, supplies to do the composting, to start the compost heap in the mayor's home. And then at the end of the period, they all took compost home to their gardens. And on the left, it's uh, they were making natural botanical soap and then they got to keep them. You can see kind of the flowers and petals in the in the soaps, and they really liked that activity. And um, this is the church, the that's the local meeting house, and there are people sitting in the pews listening to the minister of agriculture talking about composting. And it was very successful. We had between 40 and 70 community members attend each of the eight sessions, and actually 40 people came to all eight sessions. Um, And among them, we collected data, 88% used an open fire for cooking, and few had a chimney stove or a gas stove. 
And at baseline, 82% of these households reported burning their trash, including plastic. So among these 40 participants, there were 11 very enthusiastic participants who wanted to become local recyclers in their community. So they, um, we organized a three-day training at a central recycler in the, in the town um, that's about 40 minutes away from their community. And there they learned how to recycle, what could be recycled, and what was the pricing for things that are recycled. And so it was really exciting because they got to see people arriving in tr with trucks full of things that were going to be recycled. And they realized that actually this might be a revenue ge generating exercise. So we worked with these 11 community members and um, they, uh, we provided or we created a poster there in the middle that says what can be recycled and that's in green and what can't be recycled and that's in red. For instance, currently um, cardboard is not being recycled um, because of the fallen pricing. So people would put the signs up in their stores. They would explain what the prices were. And then on the far right is the recycling center where they got their training coming to pick up the cans that they had recycled. So um, this is very much a pilot study. Um, it's something that needs to be definitely worked on further. It's not um, like we miraculously solved a problem. They're definitely to work out in terms of getting products to, to the recycling center and making sure you get the right price for your goods um, and having your neighbors participate. Um, so that is just the first uh, steps in this pilot. So the second aim was we estimated air pollutant emissions from plastic emissions or plastic incineration. And what we did is we asked 50 women in the educational sessions to collect household plastic trash that they would have burned in their trash fire. And every week when they came to the educational sessions, they brought their bags of plastic trash and we sorted and weighed the plastic. And at that time, we asked them about household characteristics like number of people in the home. And so this just shows over the four weeks, um, the kilograms of plastic that were brought in um, on average. And uh, all told, we collected about 500 pounds of plastic, which were was taken to the recycling center and then um, the money was distributed back to the people that collect their, their plastic. You can see there was a little bit of a drop in week three and it never really recovered. I think maybe people were cleaning out their house on the first week. So maybe, you know, again, this is a pilot. We're not sure if this really re represents all the plastic trash they were going to burn, or maybe they thought this might be a good opportunity to clean up their house. Um, so Taking that in mind, um, I just have two slides on this emissions um, estimation, and this is really preliminary work. We haven't published it yet. There's still more um, thought processes that should go into this, um, but a student uh, on our study put this together. So there is World Bank data about the amount of plastic waste that is generated and burned, and we comp compared our local um, community, Jalapa, to the World Bank data. So um, what's not available on our survey is because we don't have generation weights, rates like they do for the World Bank. But basically what you can see is that um, in terms of mass of plastic waste generated per person per day, um, Jalapa, our community is about half of what the World Bank says that Guatemala, I should have Guatemala up there, so Guatemala generates about 0.056 and um, kilograms per person per day, and Jalapa collects um, 0.025, so half. However, um, according to the World Bank in Guatemala, 1% uh, of the people burn their plastic, which I, I'm not confident that's correct. Whereas in Jalapa, 80% of our households reported that they did do that. And therefore, the bottom line there of massive plastic waste bur burned per year, you can see how you know, they estimate in Guatemala, it's 12.1 kilograms per year, but in Jalapa, it's over 2,000 kilograms per year. That's total, not per person. Um, but I think that, um, again, this is very preliminary, but I think it does show, and I 
suspect that it's true that there it, it's greater in the rural areas where people have don't have garbage trucks going around picking up their trash. And this is, you know, at the household level, significantly higher than what would be reported for like urban areas. So the, um, from that, we estimated the emissions of um, the plastic waste that would have been burned, but it wasn't because we collected it. Um, and that's looking at emissions. So carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, and, you know, there are databases that provide like the World Bank data, and this is in grams per year for these different um, air pollutants. We had uh, over 78 air pollutants, but I chopped it way down to these common ones. Um, and so, for instance, you could see that for particulate matter, PM 2.5, um, the World Bank estimated um, that uh, about 0 0.30 grams per person per year is generated from um, burning plastic in Guatemala, but in Jalapa, it's 52 grams. So, uh, you know, over 175 times greater. So I definitely think that this is very, very preliminary data, but um, I, I do, I'm confident it is greater than what has been reported um, in, in Guatemala in the, you know, nationally. So the, the final aim, aim three, um, was uh, to measure differences in personal exposures to particulate matter and urinary biomarkers of pHs, VOCs, phenols, and phthalates. And for this part of the study, instead of working with that one community, um, we recruited 60 adolescents from that the happen trial with the gas stove that I described. So 30 in the control houses that used wood stoves, 30 in the LPG households, the, the intervention homes. And they had to be non-pregnant, non-smoking, between 13 and 17 years of age. We asked them to wear a backpack for 24 hours to collect gravimetric PM 2.5. And we collected black carbon in 50% of the kitchens. We didn't have enough monitors to do it in every household. And we completed data um, just last month and the urine biomarker data will be analyzed here at Emory, but you can see that last sad bullet there in italics that we were not able to ship our samples um, after we completed sampling because of the border shutdown. So um, I don't have any results to present here at this time on these data. So um, what are my next steps? Uh, together with our collaborators in, at the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala in Guatemala City and other um, uh, folks at Emory University. Um, I submitted an R01 through the National Institute of Health to expand the study. Um, and uh, it was um, not, didn't receive a fundable score. So that's a resubmission. But the idea is to expand what we did in one village and do a cluster randomized trial in 10 villages that would be the intervention villages where we would do the same approach and just compare it to 10 as usual, um, business as usual control villages. So we would use implementation strategies to really understand what, what actions that are community driven in the intervention villages work to reduce plastic burning and waste dumping. Um, we've realized that generating money is a very, very um, important motivator. And so the idea of perhaps like making organic soap might be that they need to take it to the level of selling it um, to, to, to really engage in activities. Um, and then the second aim is kind of um, like what we, what we did in, for our third aim, we would actually do much a, a larger monitoring with um, 40 women 400 women in 10 intervention and 10 control villages. And we do this over a longitudinal period of time to see whether the intervention worked. And the last one is to use um, tracers, antimony and um, 135 TPB that are tracers of garbage burning to, to do a better estimate of um, plastic incineration and the emissions that are generated from plastic incineration. So I would like to acknowledge my um, co-investigators at the Universidad del Valle de Guatemala. I've worked with them for 20 years and we have a really great team. 
And um, the data I presented on the emissions was with my co-investigator, Dr. Ari Saikawa and her student, Michelle Bardellis at Emory University. And this study was funded through the Emory Global Health Institute seed grant. And um, that is the end of my presentation. If you have any questions, please feel free to contact me or, or ask me questions now. I'm a very fast talker. <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. That was great. <laughs> I, I, I hope there's questions because I definitely am a fast talker. Yeah, that was that was great. Anyway, I would ask the first question from you. So the urine biomarkers that you measure, can you please explain a little bit more? And is there any biomarker for particulate matters in different sizes to measure? Um, no, the I mean we we look at the PAHs and the VOCs really. That the hard part with the pHs in the VOCs is that they're in anything that burns, right? Um, there is um, one of them uh, that is can can be a, that we looked at um, eight isoprostane, and um, I cannot, I can't, I'm really can't, chemically, I'm very bad. Um, it's eight O H D G. Um, and then there's another biomarker um, that we're not looking at, levoglucosan, which is is a plant plant derivative. So that's really a, a marker for wood. Um, but for this study, we really were interested more on the plastic the plastic biomarkers like phthalates and and phenols, which we wouldn't expect to see in people that are burning wood or people that are burning gas. I see. Yep, very good. Thank you. Yes. In, anyone else has, has any other questions? This is Luce. Can you hear me okay? Yeah. Hi, Lisa. I have a question about your third aim and how it will funnel into your R01 as you develop it. You have 400 women that will be in the proposed R01. Will you have a subset of, of adolescents that you'll focus on so that you can kind of maintain that continuity between your pilot work and your evolving R01? Yeah, you know, it is. we do have a range of women. The, the age range is quite broad. Um, I think one of the things with our pilot study was the idea that, you know, Bisphenol A and phthalates can be endocrine disruptors or are have been found to be. And so we were focusing on children that are, you know, kind of pre-adolescents. So or adolescent actually. But um I, I this specific study is really focusing on a wide range. We have no anybody can participate in the community study. And that's the way it was with our pilot of the 50 women that participated. We had people that were teenagers and we had people that were 80 years old. So um, one person in particular. So we could have um, um, we could have adolescents, but we weren't necessarily limiting to that. It's, it's a little tricky because um, who burns the trash is, is, is not, it's not like it's a task that's, established like it is with cooking where we know that that the that women do the cooking and um we're not sure about exactly whose responsibility it is to burn the trash versus cooking um so and then people burn plastic in their cooking fire as well as out in their outdoors fire so i i haven't gotten my scores back for the r01 i submitted it but i know i mean i'm sorry I, I got my scores back and it wasn't fundable, so I have to resubmit, um, but I haven't seen the comments. But I think one of the tricky things is really figuring out, you know, how the trash is, is burned um, and by whom. I think, it, I think it rotates around different family members. Thank you. Sure. 
And Lisa, you measured the 24 hour exposure for using some sort of uh, personal monitors. But, so did you let them be free going out, in and out? And how did you control how much exposure they have, you know, exactly. or yeah. whatever in the at home or something like that? Exactly. I mean, the only thing we, we did, we, we, we collected all the urine. Um, it was first morning void on the day that we picked up the equipment. So um, it, it should... Uh, we, we they they wore the monitor for the 24 hours before we we picked it up so and the urine was collected at like at 6 a.m. and we arrive at 9 a.m. Um, so they could have had breakfast and we wouldn't capture that in the urine but we would capture that on um, on the monitor so it's definitely this is one of the things you're just trying to work out like we know through our cook stove studies kind of how to do all of this but this is new territory for me trying to figure out and 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 on in addition to that um we collected a lot of survey data about other exposures to phthalates and bisphenol a like what kind of cups do you drink out of do you drink your coffee in a hot plastic cup which actually a lot of people do um what you know do you wear you know a lot of uh products like hair products or makeup or nail polish. So it could be that, that from the questionnaire data, which we haven't analyzed yet, um, that there are other exposures that overwhelm the, the fire uh, exposure. And we can't tell people to burn plastic and then measure. So that wouldn't be ethical. So we kind of have to take it as it is. That's um, correct. It'd be hard to sort it out, I think. That's the challenge. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Hey, Lisa, it's Barb Plivka. Really nice presentation, and congratulations on getting your R01 award. Awesome. I got it submitted. I didn't get it funded. <laughs> I know, but it was scored. It was scored, but it was like such at the bottom of the pile that there's no way it's going to be funded. It was like, right. but, you know, just getting it scored is is a really important first step. I think I feel good about that. Yeah. 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 So feel really good about that because then you'll get some good feedback. Right. Summary sheets come through. So congrats on that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so this whole idea of burning plastic, has that been a long standing tradition in Guatemala and some other areas? Um, well, what's really weird about the plastic is a long time ago um, in, in 2002, they had those um, fatwood sticks and they would burn the fatwood sticks right. to fire. And then um, Guatemala prohibited the fatwood sticks because they said they came from some species of tree that was, um, you know, uh, endangered. And so people didn't have fire starting things. So they realized that throwing a Coke bottle in there was a really started the fire quick. And so I had, I thought at first my, Oh, that they just don't know what to do with it. So they're throwing it in the, in their cook stove. And then, you know, over time they're like, no, this actually helps start the fire. Yeah. Lou sent a little message. I can't, I just kind of saw it for a glimpse, but in Malawi, they also burn plastic. Was it for, to get rid of it or was it to make the fire go faster? I always assumed it was to get rid of it, but it could have had that sort of accelerant purpose. But I, it was fairly common to see people just burning it casually to get their kind of rubbish pile down. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a bit, it is, you know, I mean, I remember my grandfather putting the, you know, barrel in the backyard and burning everything in it. So, you know, it, <laughs> we did. Yeah, there wasn't as much plastic back then, I'm sure. Exactly. It was like leaves or something. Leaves, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we had to complain about one of our neighbors burning leaves last fall. And it's like, no, do you have any <laughs> idea what you're doing? Um, so... So that since 2002, this has been a practice, right? Of burning. And it sounds like it might have started in happenstance. 
Probably. Yeah, I mean, it. I don't. Rem- I don't know exactly when it started. Right. But I'd say like maybe two thousand and five. I started to see it more. I'm just thinking that's through one generation, probably, in that there were pregnancies and births to young women. So, do you see what I'm? I'm just wondering about that. The impact on fetal development, childhood development. I think that's getting back at what Luz was saying, but I'm thinking earlier than that. I'm just curious about that. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. The first time I went there was 2002. I have no idea what, when plastic, to be so ubiquitous that everybody's drinking out of plastic bottles, but it's been been a while. But that burning and those um, <clears throat> outgassing and the um, yeah exposures would have occurred to um, childbearing age women and men. Yes, so there yeah. could be well be an impact on the fetal and you know infant development. And yeah, uh, again, I'll refer to Luz and the Peds people, but um, I'm just curious about that. Yeah, it's. It's really interesting study. Thank you. Yeah, it was it was one of the most fun studies I had because the community of people that engaged with the the anthropologist were really fired up. I mean, they were it was so great to see that it was kind of like, you know, th- there actually was no um, we didn't pay them to come to the classes, uh, mm-hmm. but what Mayeri did was she said, I, I will, after the class, I will buy everybody food at the local stand, but you have to bring your own cup, plate and utensils. Cause you're, I'm not going to let them serve you on plastic. And so every day they would come with their, their, or every week they would show up with their own plate cup and, and utensils. And then, um, I was there in, in February of this year and they came to the office and they said, we're, we're, we just carry these around with us everywhere now. We just, they're in our purse. <laughs> <laughs> and as a result of cleaning up the plastic to sell to the recyclers, that, that community is actually really bothered by plastic now. And they're, you know, cleaning up the sides of the road. So I feel like it just like a little, a little bit of work and then off they go. And um, so I don't know whether that's peculiar to that one community or maybe, you know, it's it's it could be a push in other communities as well. Um, but so it's- I'm also curious about um, you know there's a lot of press about the fact that we don't have as many places to send our recycling anymore, and who's taking it and what's happening to it. Is that an issue at all? And the thought, you know, like what do we do? you know, how do we manage this? China's not taking it anymore, et cetera. I know it's a, it's a problem here as well. Um, I, I know that in Guatemala and we've been keeping our eye out on it on different programs, but they are recycling plastic in the Guatemala city and they're manufacturing like woven plastic bags and furniture, like outdoor patio furniture. Oh, okay. Um, yeah. yeah. So, but the problem is getting it to the Guatemala city in communities that don't have cars um, is a problem. But um, I think that idea of turning trash into into something else, um, or as Maya was having them do, like just don't use the tr- plastic plate at the outdoor vendor at all. So. Um, but it's hard to avoid the plastic bottle. That's almost impossible there. Well, it's tough here as well. It's tough. Everywhere. Yeah, for sure. But I am drinking out of my ceramic cup, so. Good. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> now that we're at home, I wonder yeah. <laughs> since we've been home, whether that has been, we're reducing the use of plastic. We're not going out as much, although I know now you can't carry your own canvas bag into the store. So right. it's a little bit more plastic bag going on. Yeah, a lot more plastic bag going on. That was 
the negative of the whole thing. But yeah. you're right, the positive is the air quality. And I hadn't thought about the, the decreased use of plastic bottles. Yeah. I still, you know, I've heard, well, I haven't been to the grocery, but um, people are still buying a lot of water and bottles. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. But maybe it's decreased a bit since we're drinking more from home in our own glasses and cups. So, yeah. Yeah, maybe. I have seen some different stories that are more people that um, talk about using plastics as insulators and building materials and, you know, incorporating plastic waste into bricks, things like that. Yeah, I mean, I think I've seen houses where they fill the soda bottles with stuff and make houses out of big plastic two liter bottles. I don't know how well those stand up to time. Um, another thing that um, people were looking at is these large three liter plastic bottles like they have in Guatemala and using them to pure, to pasteurize the water. I don't, not, not, uh, it's not exactly pasteurized, but it, you, you fill the water on the, in the bottle and then you put it on the roof and it heats up. But of course, what the plasticizer also goes into the water, not just the, the water is purified to a certain extent, but then all that hot plastic is, you know, gotten into the water. So, but anyway, well, thank you for listening. Um, I don't know, do you have, um, Luz, do you guys have business to do now? I no, just just to praise Azita because she's done such fabulous work all year. But we usually have our um, webinar and leave time for discussions, and then um, unless we've planned a business meeting, we 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 leave it at that. But right now, it's just a round of applause for Azita. Yeah, yeah, it was. <laughs> Now, are you all planning to go to Cannes? Yeah, but I still haven't heard anything more about what the um, who's presenting, or much more about the um, I, what what the day is going to be like. The schedule. Have you? Um, 